Um, so tell us the story about how you got discovered and signed. Ah, I got fired. So your favorite label. I got fired from D'Angelo's band. <laughs> I didn't know what I was going to do. <laughs> and then, uh, um, when I first moved to New York, I, I just wanted to sing background for people and like just do my jazz thing. And so, I, I, um, I got a job singing background for Erica and um, D'Angelo, and they both fired me. So, it sounded really bad. Well, Erica, she's just so pretty, so I was just looking at her like, oh, this is all. And she keep turning around like, your part, you know? And D'Angelo is. Yeah, it's like I'm on stage, like, I can't believe this. <laughs> And like the same thing happened with D'Angelo, but D'Angelo's very like particular and he has like, it's very meticulous and so many things to memorize, it's lots of, you've been, everybody's been to a D'Angelo show, it's very intricate, it's, everything has its place, and he's like, you know, like Stevie Wonder, I've heard stories about Stevie, like D'Angelo's like that, you know, he's like everyone, he's on everyone, like are you doing your note, you know? used to have like late night vocal rehearsals and I just, I'm horrible at remembering stuff. Like I'm a jazz musician, you know, so most of the time I'm making stuff up. <laughs> and so, in the band, it was like Roy Harbrough was playing trumpet, like Pino Palladino on bass, Amir was on drums, like everybody, you know, everybody I grew up in high school, like all of our friends talking about these musicians, I'm in the band with them. So was, once again, I was just like, oh, I can't believe this. <laughs> and D'Angelo was like, sing your note. And I was like in charge of the high notes. And he, all his notes like, doo, doo, doo. I was missing every last one. <laughs> so I got fired. Got fired. But everybody in the band was in the industry, so. I gave everybody like one my demo tape and and eventually I started getting phone calls. You know. D'Angelo fired me, but we were still cool, you know. He was just like, you got you can't be in my <laughs> You can't be my man, man. You know, you're not learning your parts. But you know, he used to call me all the time and check up on me. He's like, you know, I think you're more suited for your own thing, man. You should really like just start doing your own stuff, because you, you're not going to last in anyone's band. <laughs> <laughs> but you did get signed mm -hmm. to Interscope, and you put out uh, put out your first album, first... Uh, first one, second. second. Um, yeah. And on that record is a song with world famous Dr. Dre, Oh yeah. So let's listen to a little bit of Fast Lane. Nice. So here you are, our first major label album starting out, and you're working with Dr. Dre. I mean, were you impressed? Uh, it was just like the Angelos band. I was like, oh God, I can't believe this. <laughs> you know, but I'm in the studio, so I'm not really on the spot. But I do remember coming into Dr. Dre's studio. This is before, like, I've ever, I've never, now it's like a staple, everybody's doing it now, but Dre was the first person to have six gigantic speakers, like a wall of speakers. Like usually you go in a studio and it's only two big speakers, you know, over the console. He had three big speakers and then like three subwoofers at the bottom. So I noticed all of his employees had earplugs in. And you know, I didn't I didn't know what it was for, you know, until he came in and played this song. And, and I mean he turned it to eleven. I've never felt anything like it was more than sound. It was like in 
it was like an earthquake of sound. Like, it like, felt like my face was like going back. And that's when I realized, can Dre really hear? Because he didn't have any, he didn't have anything in his Dre, how did, how did you learn, you know, the studio? He's, he's, he taught himself. And he had to because um, Suge Knight had beat up all of the engineers in Los Angeles. <laughs> True story. 